Live Radio Theater's second podcast work project, this time offering a play performance, as Marvet said, based on the novel The Big Time, which won the Hugo Award in 1958 for Best Novel or Novelette, and was written by Fritz Lieber, who is considered to be one of the legendary writers of science fiction. The Big Time first appeared in two installments in the leading science fiction magazine of its day under the direction and tutelage of Horace L. Gold, who just happens to be E.J. Gold's father. When one rode as a passenger in a car driven by my spiritual godmother, who was quite elderly, she used to say, referring to the task of driving, this is a group effort. And we invite you to participate here today with that attitude in mind and consider yourself not just an observer, but an active participant in the adventures, perceptions, and explorations that we are about to engage in. Once again, we welcome you. Enjoy the show. The Big Time by Fritz Lieber. You can't know there's a war on for the snakes coil and spiders weave to keep you from knowing it's being fought over your live and dead body. Chapter one. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. Macbeth. Enter three hussars. My name is Greta Forzane. 29 and a party girl would describe me. I was born in Chicago of Scandinavian parents. So now I operate chiefly outside space and time, not in heaven or hell, if there are such places, but not in the cosmos or universe you know either. I am not as romantically entrancing as the immortal film star who also bears my first name, but I have a rough and ready charm of my own. I need it for my job is to nurse back to health and kid back to sanity, soldiers badly roughed up in the biggest war going. This war is the change war, a war of time travelers. In fact, our private name for being in this war is being on the big time. Our soldiers fight by going back to change the past or even ahead to change the future in ways to help our side win the final victory a billion or more years from now. A long killing business, believe me. You don't know about the change war, but it's influencing your lives all the time. And maybe you've had hints of it without realizing. Have you ever worried about your memory because it doesn't seem to be bringing you exactly the same picture of the past from one day to the next? Have you ever been afraid that your personality was changing because of forces beyond your knowledge or control? Have you ever felt sure that sudden death was about to jump you from nowhere? Have you ever been scared of ghosts? Not the storybook kind, but the billions of beings who were once so real and strong, it's hard to believe they'll just sleep harmlessly forever. Have you ever wondered about those things you may call devils or demons, spirits able to range through all time and space? through the hearts of stars and the cold skeleton of space between the galaxies? Have you ever thought that the whole universe might be a crazy mixed up dream? If you have, you've had hints of the change war. <clears throat> how I got recruited into the change war, how it's conducted, what the two sides are, why you don't consciously know about it, 
what I really think about it, you'll learn in due course. The place outside the cosmos where I and my pals do our nursing job, I simply call the place. A lot of my nursing consists of amusing and humanizing soldiers fresh back from raids into time. In fact, my formal title is entertainer, and I've got my silly side, as you'll find out. My pals are two other gals and three guys from quite an assortment of times and places. We're a pretty good team, and with Saw Sid bossing, we run a pretty good recuperation station. But we have our family troubles. But most of our troubles come slamming into the place with the beat up soldiers who've generally just been through hell and want to raise some of their own. As a matter of fact, it was three newly arrived soldiers who started this thing I'm gonna tell you about. This thing that showed me so much about myself and everything. When it started, I had been on the big time for a thousand sleeps and 2000 nightmares and working in the place for the 500, 1000. This two nightmare routine, every time you lay down your dizzy little head is rough, but you pretend to get used to it because being on the big time is supposed to be worth it. The place is midway in size and atmosphere between a large nightclub where the entertainers sleep in and a small Zeppelin hangar decorated for a party, though a Zeppelin is one thing we haven't had yet. You go out of the place, but not often if you have any sense, and if you are an entertainer like me, into the cold light of a morning filled with anything from the earlier dinosaurs to the later spacemen, who look strangely similar except for size. Solely on doctor's orders, I have been on cosmic leave six times since coming to work at the place, meaning I have had six brief vacations, if you care to call them that, for believe me, they are busman's holidays, considering what goes on in the place all the time. The last one I spent in Renaissance Rome where I got a crush on a Césaire Borgia, but I got over it. Vacations are for the birds, anyway, because they have to be fitted by the spiders into serious operations of the change war. And you can imagine how restful that makes them. See those soldiers changing the past? You stick along with them. Don't go too far up front, though, but don't wander off either. Relax and enjoy yourself. Ha! Now, the kind of recuperation soldiers get when they come to the place is a horse of a far brighter color, simply dazzling by comparison. Entertainment is our business, and we give them a bang up time and send them staggering happily back into action. So once in a great while, something may happen to throw a wee shadow on the party. I am dead in some ways. Don't let that bother you. I'm lively enough in others. If you met me in the cosmos, you would, you would be more apt to yak with me or try to pick me up than ask a cop to do same or father to douse me with his holy water, unless you're one of those hard boiled reformer types. But you are not likely to meet me in the cosmos because Bar Basin Street in the Prater, 15th century Italy and Augustan Rome until they spoiled it are my favorite, ha, vacation spots. And as I've said, I stick as close to the place as I can. It is really the nicest place in the whole change world. Crisis, I even think of it capitalized. Anywho, when this thing started, I was twiddling my thumbs on the couch nearest the piano and thinking it was too late to do my fingernails and whoever came in probably wouldn't notice them anyway. The place was jumpy, like it always is on an approach, and the gray velvet of the void around us was curdled with the uneasy lights you see when you close your eyes in the dark. Sid was tuning the maintainers for the pickup and the right shoulder of his gold worked gray doublet was streaked where he'd been wiping his face on it with quick ducks of his head. Beauregard was leaning as close as he could over Sid's other shoulder, one white trousered knee indenting the rose plush of the control divan, and he wasn't missing a single flicker of Sid's old fingers on the dials. 
Bo's co-pilot, besides piano teacher, piano player. Bo's face had that dead blank look it must have had when every double eagle he owned, and more he didn't, were riding on the next car to be turned in the gambling saloon at one of those wedding cake Mississippi steamboats. Doc was soused as usual, sitting at the bar with his top hat pushed back and his knitted shawl pulled around him, his wide eyes seeing whatever horrors a life in Nazi-occupied Tsarist Russia can add to being a drunk demon in the change world. Maud, who is the old girl, and Lily, the new girl, of course, were telling the big beads of their identical pearl necklaces. You might say that all of us entertainers were a bit edgy. Being demons doesn't automatically make us brave. Then the red telltale on the major maintainer went out and the door began to darken in the void facing Sid and Bo and I felt the change winds blowing hard and my heart missed a couple of beats. And the next thing, three soldiers had stepped out of the cosmos and into the place, their first three steps hitting the floor hard as they changed times and weights. They were dressed as officers of Hussars and we'd been advised and, praise the Bonnie Dew, I saw that the first of them was Eric, my own dear little commandant, the pride of the von Hohenwalds and the terror of the snakes. Behind him was some hard-faced Roman or other, and beside Eric, and shouldering into him as they stamped forward, was a new boy, blonde with a face like a Greek god who's just been touring a Christian hell. They were uniformly exactly alike in black, shakos, fur-edged polices, boots, and so forth, with white skull em emblems on the shakos. The only difference between them was that Eric had a collar on his wrist, and the new boy had black gauntleted glove in his left hand and was clenching the mate in it, in his right hand, bare like both of Eric's and Roman's. You made it, lads. Hearts of gold? Sid boomed at them, and Bo twitched a smile and murmured something courtly, and Maud began to chant. Shut the door. And the new girl copied her, and I joined in because the change winds do blow like crazy when the door is open, even though it can't yet ever be shut tight enough to keep them from leaking through. Shut it before it blows wrinkles in our faces she called in her gammon voice to break the ice, looking like a skinny teenager in the tight, knee-length frock she'd copied from the new girl. But the three soldiers weren't paying attention. The Roman, I remembered his name was Mark, was blundering forward stiffly, as if there was something wrong with his eyes, while Eric and the new boy were yelling at each other about a kid and Einstein in a summer palace and a bloody glove and the snakes having booby traps St. Petersburg. Eric had that taut, sadistic smile he gets when he wants to hit me. The new boy was in a tearing rage. Why did you pull us out so bloody fast? The fair chewed the Nevsky prospect to pieces galloping away. Didn't you feel their stun guns do pop when they sprung the trap? Too soon, got Sidonk. I did. Not enough to numb a cat. Why didn't you show us action? Shut up. I'm your leader. I'll show you action enough. You won't. You're a filthy Nazi coward. Weibischer Englander. Bloody hun. Schlange. The blonde lad knew enough German to understand that last crack. He threw back his sable-edged police to clear his sword arm, and he swung away from Eric which bumped him into Bo. At the first sign of the quarrel, Bo had raised himself from the divan as quickly and silently as a, no, I won't use that word, and slithered over to them. Sirs, you forget yourselves, he said sharply, off balance, supporting himself on the new boy's upraised arm. This is Sidney Lessingham's place of entertainment and recuperation. There are ladies. With a contemptuous snarl, the new boy shoved him off, 
and snatched with his bare hands for his saber. Bo reeled against the divan. It caught him in the shins, and he fell forward toward the maintainers. Sid whisked them out of the way, as if they were a couple of beach radios, simply nothing in the places nailed down, and had them back on the coffee table before Bo hit the floor. Meanwhile, Eric had his saber out and had parried the new boy's first wild slash and lunged in return, and I heard the scream of steel and the rutch of his boot on the diamond-studded pavement. Bo rolled over and came up, pulling from the ruffles of his shirt bosom a derringer I knew was some other weapon in disguise, a stun gun, or even an atropo. Besides scaring me damp for Eric and everybody that brought me up short, us entertainers' nerves must be getting as naked as the soldiers, probably starting when the spiders canceled all cosmic leagues twenty sleeps back. Sid shot Bo his look of command, rapped out, I'll handle this, you horse and firebrand. And turned to the minor maintainer. I noticed that the telltale on the major was glowing a reassuring red again, and I found a moment to thank Mama Devi that the door was shut. Maud was jumping up and down, cheering I don't know which, nor did she, I bet, and the new girl was white, and I saw that the sabers were working more businesslike. Eric's flicked, flicked, flicked again, and came away from the blonde lad's cheek, spilling a couple of red drops. The blonde lad lunged fiercely. Eric jumped back, and the next moment they were both floating helplessly in the air, twisting like they had cramps. I realized quick enough that Sid had, Sid had shut off the gravity in the door and store sectors of the place, leaving the rest of us firm on our feet in the refresher and surgery sectors. The place has sectional gravity to suit our extraterrestrial buddies. Those crazy ETs sometimes come whooping in for recuperation in very mixed batches. From his central position, Sid called out, kindly enough, but taking no nonsense. All right, Lars, you've had your fun. Now sheath those swords. For a second or two, the two black hussars drifted and contorted. Eric laughed harshly and neatly obeyed. The commandant is used to free fall. The blonde lad stopped writhing, hesitated while he glared upside down at Eric, and managed to get his saber into the scabbard, although he turned a slow somersault doing it. Then Sid switched on their gravity slow enough so that they wouldn't get sprained landing. Eric laughed lightly this time and stepped out briskly toward us. He stopped to clap the new boy firmly on the shoulder and look him in the face. So now you get a good scar. The other didn't pull away, but he didn't look up and Eric came on. Sid was hurrying toward the new boy, and as he passed Eric, he wagged a finger at him and gaily said, You rogue. Next thing, I was giving Eric my man your home hug, and he was kissing me and cracking my ribs and saying, Liebchen, Dobchen. Which was fine with me because I do love him, and I'm a good lover, and as much a doppelganger as he is. We just pulled back from each other to get a breath. His blue eyes looked so sweet in his warm face when there was a thud behind us. With the snapping of the tension, Doc had fallen off his bar stool and his top hat was over his eyes. As we turned to chuckle at him, Maud squeaked. And we saw that the Roman had walked straight up against the void and was marching along there steadily without gaining a foot. Like it does happen, his black uniform melting into that inside-your-head gray. Maud and Bo rushed over to fish him back, which can be tricky. The thin gambler was all courtly efficiency again. Sid supervised from a distance. What's wrong with him? I asked Eric. He shrugged. Overdue for change shock, and he was nearest the stun guns. His horse almost threw him. My God, you should have seen St. Petersburg, Liebchen. The Nevsky Prospect, the canals flying by like reception carpets of blue sky. A cavalry troop in blue and gold that blundered across our escape. Fine women in furs and ostrich plumes. A monk with a big tripod 
and his head under a hood. It gave me the horror seeing all those zombies flashing past, and staring at me in that sick, unawakened way they have, and knowing that some of them, say the photographer, might be snakes. Our side of the change war is the spiders. The other side is the snakes. So all of us, spiders and snakes alike, are double gangers and demons too, because we're cut out of our lifeline in the cosmos. Your lifeline is all of you from birth to death. We're double gangers because we can operate both in the cosmos and outside of it. And demons, because we act reasonably alive while we're doing so, which the ghosts don't. Entertainers and soldiers are all demon double gangers, whichever side they're on. Though they say the snake places are simply ghastly. Zombies are dead people whose lifelines lie in the so-called past. What were you doing in St. Petersburg before the ambush? I asked Eric. That is, if you could talk about it. Why not? We were kidnapping the infant Einstein back from the snakes in 1883. Yes, the snakes got him, Liebchen. Only a few sleeps back, endangering the West's whole victory over Russia. Which gave your dear little Hitler the world on a platter for 50 years and got me loved to death by your sterling troops in the liberation of Chicago. But which leads to the ultimate victory of the spiders and the West over the snakes and communism, Liebchen. Remember that. Anyway, our counter snatch didn't work. The snakes had guards posted. Most unusual, and we weren't warned. The whole thing was a great mess. No wonder Bruce lost his head. Not that it excuses him. New boy? I asked. Sid hadn't gotten to him, and he was still standing with hooded eyes where Eric had left him, a dark pillar of shame and rage. Yeah, a lieutenant from World War I, an Englishman. I gathered that. Is he really effeminate? By Bisher? I had to call him something when he said I was a coward. He'll make a fine soldier, only needs a little more shaping. You men are so original when you spat. I lowered my voice, but you shouldn't have gone on and called him a snake, Eric Mine. <laughs> Schlang? His smile got crooked. Who knows about any of us? As St. Petersburg showed me, the snake spies are getting cleverer than ours. The blue eyes didn't look sweet now. Are you, Liebchen, really nothing more than a good loyal spider? Eric! All right, I went too far, with Bruce and with you too. We're all hacked these days, riding with one leg over the breaking edge. Maud and Bo were supporting the Roman to a couch, Maud taking most of his weight, with Sid still supervising and the new boy still sulking by himself. The new girl should have been with him, of course, but I couldn't see her anywhere, and I decided she was probably having a nervous breakdown in the refresher, a little jerk. The Romans look pretty bad, Eric, I said. Ah, uh, Mark's tough. Got virtue, as his people say, and our little starship girl will bring him back to life if anybody can, and if... You call this living. He was right. Maud had 50 odd years of psychomedical experience. 23rd century at that. It should have been Doc's job, but that was 50 drunks back. Maud and Mark, that will be an interesting experiment. Reminiscent of Goering's with the frozen men and the naked gypsy girls. You are filthy Nazi. She'll be getting... She'll be using electrophoresis in deep suggestion if I know anything. How will you be able to know anything, Liebchen, if she switches on the couch curtains, as I perceive she is preparing to do? Filthy Nazi, I said and meant. Precisely. He clicked his heels and bowed a millimeter. Erich Friedrich von Hohenwald, Oberlieutenant in the Army of the Third Reich, fell at Narvik where he was recruited by the spiders. Lifeline lengthened by a big change after his first death, 
and its latest report, Commandant of Toronto, where he maintains extensive baby farms to provide him with breakfast meat, if you believe the handbills of the Voyagers Underground. At your service. Oh, Eric, it's all so lousy, I said, touching his hand, reminded that he was one of the unfortunates resurrected from a point in their lifeline well before their death. In his case, because the date of his death had been shifted forward by a big change after his resurrection. And as every demon finds out, if he can't imagine it beforehand, it is pure hell to remember your future. And the shorter the time between your resurrection and your death back at the cosmos, the better. Mine, bless Babed Din, was only an action-packed 10 minutes on North Clark Street. Eric put his other hand lightly over mine. Fortunes of the change, Vorliebchen. At least I'm a soldier and sometimes assigned to future operations. So why we should have this monomania about our future personalities back there, I don't know. Mine is a stupid oberst, thin as paper and frightfully indignant at the voyagers. But it helps me a little if I see him in perspective and at least get back to the cosmos pretty regularly, dot Sidonk. So I'm better off than you entertainers. I didn't say aloud that a changing cosmos is worse than none, but I found myself sending a prayer to the Bonnie Dew for my father's repose, so that the changing winds would blow lightly across the lifelong of Anton A. Forzane, professor of physiology, born in Norway and buried in Chicago Woodlawn Cemetery is a nice gray spot. That's all right, Eric. We entertain's got mittens, too. He scowled at me suspiciously, as if he were wondering whether I had all my buttons on. Mittens? What do you mean? I'm not wearing any. Are you trying to say something about Bruce's gloves? Which, incidentally, seem to annoy him for some reason. No, seriously, Greta, why do you entertainers need mittens? Because we get cold feet sometimes. At least I do. Got mittens, as I say. A sickly light dawned on his Prussian puss, he muttered. Got mittens. Got mit uns. God with us. <laughs> Greta, I don't know how I put up with you the way you murder a great language for cheap laughs. You've got to take me as I am, mittens and all, thank the bonny dew. And I hasten to explain, that's French, le bon dieu, the good God. Don't hit me. I'm not going to tell you any more of my secrets. He laughed feebly like he was dying. Cheer up, I said. I won't be here forever, and there are worse places than the place. He nodded grudgingly, looking around. You know what, Greta? If you'll promise not to make some dreadful joke out of it, on operations, I pretend I'll soon be going backstage to court the world-famous ballerina Greta Forzane. He was right about the backstage part. The place is a regular theater in the round, with the void for an audience. The void's gray, hardly disturbed by the screen's masking surgery, the refresher and stores. Between the last two are the bar and kitchen and the Bose piano. Between surgery and the sector where the door usually appears are the shelves and tabarets of the art gallery. The control divan is stage center. Spaced around at a fair distance are six big low couches, one with its curtains now shooting up into the gray, and a few small tables. It's like a ballet set and, a, and the crazy costumes and characters the turn up don't ruin the illusion. By no means, Diaghilev would have hired most of them for the ballet russe on first sight without even asking them whether they could keep time to music. <laughs>